Well, good evening, everybody that's in Australia and for those elsewhere. Um, good time to you. Hello. And uh, <laughs> we're just having a little informal discussion here about the sanctuary. Is there a sanctuary in heaven? And if there is, what is it like? Like, what does it tell us about God, about uh, the world that we live in, and about what we need to do to please God? So I'm joined here by Adam and Lior. Uh, g'day, guys. G'day. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whenever I have a conversation with these two, I know that we're going to go deep. But at the same time, we're going to stay practical. We're going to keep things, um, we're going to stay, keep our feet on the ground, even if our head's in, a little bit in the clouds. What do you think, guys? Does that sound Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So, my, excuse me as I had on because I got these uh, these earphones so that my sound doesn't go crazy. And let's have a prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that you've given us your holy word, the Bible, that we can understand the truth about the universe. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us by your word and by your spirit as we uh, discuss it today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well... Leo, Adam. Mm. Now, last week, uh, Adam and I just had a bit of a chat and we just had a ramble about the book of Daniel. Um, but Leo, I understand you want to talk about a different book today, and I think that's fine. I think, you know, in these discussions, we can be as natural as we want. We just raise a topic and we talk about it and I guess try to try to nut out that topic. And then um, once we're done with that topic, we can move on to another one. So, Leo, what did you want to talk about uh, So. Today? So today, um, today uh, we'll be speaking again about the investigator judgment. And um, okay. last last time we tapped a lot into Daniel Daniel eight fourteen and um, uh, it's and how that adds more context into the investigator judgment. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there are also more books that add more context to the investigative judgment, and one of them is Hebrews. And um, I was just hoping that we could. Um, really tap into the book of Hebrews today and uh, maybe a little bit even on the book of Revelation because ultimately those two books are very important and show Christ's work for us in heaven. Sounds good. Okay, so mm -hmm. in a minute, Leo will Bible verse that he wants us to read together and we'll read that and we will discuss it. But before that, maybe just to begin with, we should define our terms. Uh, what does the term investigative judgment mean? Um, Adam, do you want to take a, take a shot at that? Oh, I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> it's, it is actually a big question with, with regards to how much we've actually started this conversation, so I suppose it's, it's a bit overwhelming in that sense. But it, it, investigative judgment mm. um, really, I suppose, originally derives from um, Daniel chapter 7 where we see um, this judgment in heaven. It says the, the court was seated and the books were opened. We see the Ancient of Days sitting and all the angels. Well, it says thousands and thousands and 10,000. It's like millions of angels sort of thing. And we find that same reference again in Revelation. Um, and that's how we find out it's angels. It doesn't say angels in Daniel. But, yeah, it's, it's basically some kind of judgment where books are opened um, or there's an investigation going on. I probably don't know that I'd want to say much more than that because I'd, I'd rather us actually pull it out from Scripture rather than just say it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, And we can certainly start here in Hebrews to make some connections. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. Does that answer the question in a kind of a simple way without getting too deep without Scripture? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I think so, um, mm. just from that. And I would like to add to that as well. I think, um, you know, you started with Daniel 7. I think another important text is Daniel 8.14, the last, one, the last text that we actually discussed last week. Sure. Um, and more specific, yeah, onto 2,300 2, days, the sanctuary will be yeah. planned. And, um, sure. you know, to add more to what you were saying about Christ's work and things like that. Um, it's also um, it's also Christ interceding for us in heaven. That's the investigative judgment, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's the it's the ultimate the ultimate um, space and time where Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place. 
And uh, yeah, that's when, um, as far as my knowledge is concerned, as far as I've heard, that's when investigator judgment um, began. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I so like I guess that. The, I guess a point that I want to emphasise because um, I I think I agree with what you guys were saying, but to me I think first of all we need to establish when we talk about an investigative judgment, what it sounds like is uh, God trying to investigate all your problems and trying to um, find you guilty. I think that's to most people when they hear that phrase, that's what they're thinking that it means. Um, so I guess to me. I would be wonder, asking the question, is, is that what it means or is it something different? And, and that would be, I think, an important thing to discuss before we ask about when it begins or, or what it is. You know, is it something that is about judging us in the sense of a condemning or is it something, some other kind of judgment that we're not so familiar with? Mm-hmm. Good question. Did you want to have a go at Lior or do you want me to? Um, yeah, so... I think uh, I was watching um, a presentation by um, Dr. Desmond Ford, and he said that um, he said something along the lines of when discussing the investigative judgment, you know, it's it's not really um, it's not really it's it's kind of like angels trying to figure out what I did on the fourteenth of March, nineteen thirty-six, you know, or something like that. Um, uh, so that's kind of the way that he painted it. Um, I don't think, I'm not really sure about that. Um, And I think that kind of elaborates more on Daniel's question that he proposed, you know, is that kind of what it is? Um, Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Look, I I agree with that. I mean, judgment is an interesting thing because if, if you actually follow it from beginning to end, there's actually phases of judgment. And the interesting thing about them is if, if I was to word it differently, they're really God being transparent in how he deals with sin and sinners. Um, he, he opens his uh, what he does up to the gaze of angels. He opens what he does up to humanity um, and he opens so uh, to everyone gets to see and, and kind of go, oh, okay, I understand now why God chose this method in this way. In fact, Daniel chapter 7 says that judgment is in favour of the saints. So it's actually something that's really good. In fact, I might even go as far as to say in, in Revelation, um, in the fifth seal, the, the, it's, it gives this imagery of souls who have died for Jesus and it says souls or the blood of souls who are under the altar and they're crying out, how long, O God, until you judge and avenge us. So they actually want judgment. They're looking forward to judgment. And if you go back to the time of Israel, um, one of the festivals, the Day of Atonement, which was also uh, the Day of Atonement was something that people looked forward to because it was a special day where God was going to remove all of Israel's sins that had gone into the sanctuary every day that year. Um, Now, some may want to have questions about that and we'd have to explore that in Leviticus and and so on. But it was actually a a good day for if you were a believer and a follower of God, it was a fantastic day. Judgment was not something you went away from. Judgment was something you desperately wanted to be a part of because it it basically got you off the hook in a sense. (laughs) Yeah. Did you want to comment on that, Leo, or...? Um, no, I think uh, I think he. I think that's uh, pretty good. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. accurate. Okay, so uh, I just also wanted to add. Then there's this other dimension as well, and it's actually one that um, Wally has uh, reminded me of. And for those that don't know who I'm talking about, Wally is is someone that we were discussing this with as well, who was uh, identifying some issues with the way that we understand the sanctuary. But he, he, one of the things he mentioned was that we actually, um, we talk about the little horn as being Rome, right? The, the Roman religious political power. Um, and yet when it comes to the judgment, we suddenly move to it being about the saints, whereas though it's clearly the judgment on the little horn. It's on mm-hmm. the, the Roman uh, religious political power. So I think that's another, that's a very important aspect of the judgment, which could also, you could say, be, is, is also an investigative judgment. It's mm. investigating the, uh, the evils 
of a corrupt system or whatever, you know, and we can get into that. But mm. there's a lot to this this term. You know, we, we use this term investigative judgment and sort of just, you know, throw it around here and there. Um, but at the end of the day, it can be quite a complex concept and quite, quite difficult yeah. to to really pin down what we mean mm. when we say that. Um, so I don't know if there's a, a better term we want to use or if we would just keep using the term and just hope that people understand. I, I think, sorry, go. Here no, you go. I was just going to say we'd have to unpack it more, I think, from Scripture. Um, for, for people to really grasp it. But there is a story in the Old Testament, I think, that kind of illustrates this point. It's, it's found in, in the, the story of Abraham and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, you, you see the Lord comes down with a couple of angels and they actually come down because they talk about the outcry has come up to heaven and they've come to investigate to see if it's really as bad as they've heard in this, in, in this imagery and and. In this imagery, what happens is God doesn't just judge the innocent and the wicked and punish everyone. He actually, the angels actually bring out the righteous from that city and get them out before the punishment is brought down. So, again, judgment for those who reject God, yes, is quite a negative thing. But for those who accept God, it's actually a wonderful thing. It's a saving thing. That's that's just all I was going to say. Yeah, so... Um, I kind of wanted to add a bit more into speaking about definitions, and then I really want to get into the book of Hebrews. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think so. Something I'd like to note um, investigative judgment and heavenly sanctuary are kind of the same thing. Um, I think that there would be, uh, well, I'm not really quite sure how to put this. I was going to say, if there is no investigative judgment, then there is no heavenly sanctuary. But I don't think that that would be quite one hundred percent accurate. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, it, like, it, even when I'm just talking, when I say heavenly sanctuary, um, and, or investigative judgment, I think it's like basically the same thing, or they are like related. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would agree with that concept because. Yeah. Uh, the reality is um, part of the sanctuary, specifically the, the the most holy place, was dedicated to that very thing. That was that was what happened. That was the day of judgment, the day that God would um, wipe away the sins of Israel. And so, it. I think you're right. I mean, there was a little more to it because the um, the holy place was also also there, and that wasn't. It was connected to judgment, but it wasn't judgment itself. Um, so I, th I think you're right to, to have a heavenly sanctuary. If we can establish there's a heavenly sanctuary and that that is somehow connected to the earthly sanctuary, which taught us about a concept of judgment, then we definitely have to kind of see that these two things are very much linked in some mm -hmm. way. Okay. So we'll unleash Leo a little and let him show us a verse in Hebrews. Where you want to start, Leo? Sure. Um, so I'll be showcasing multiple things in regards to the book of Hebrews because um, there is, well, a lot to show. Um, can I share my screen? Um, or is that not correct? Okay. I'll, I'll do my best without it. So, you want to share your screen? You can try a bit for it. Uh, let's yeah, see. Okay. Uh, how's that? Let's go. How's so that? So are you trying to share your screen? Yeah. Um, um, can they all see that? Just, yeah. Okay. Uh, what you've got on your screen at the moment is um, is just us. But if you okay, share cool. something different on your screen, then I can put it up on the, okay. on the stream. All right. Great. So um, when we look into the book of Hebrews, um, I think the first place to go is actually, oh, it's, I think the first place to go is actually um, Hebrews 2. And what we see in Hebrews 2 is we see that um, Christ has actually become our high priest, especially through um, Hebrews 10, 17. He has become a faithful high priest um, in service to God that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. We also see um, in Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 5 and in Hebrews 7, Christ is called our high priest. And in Hebrews 1, 3, 8, 8 2, and 10, 12, I believe it is, he has actually sat down at the right hand of the Father. And um, 
how do I stop sharing? Oh goodness, I'm, all this new technology yeah. stuff I'm horrible at. Yeah, all good. <laughs> Just let me know when you want me to uh, take away the share, so that way you don't have to worry oh, about okay, it. Okay, 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 um, cool. Um, yeah. So don't take it yet. Um, okay, you, so yeah, thus far okay. we've established um, in Hebrews one, Hebrews eight, and Hebrews ten, Christ sits down at the right hand of the Father. Okay, mm -hmm. in Hebrews two, four, five, and seven, he is called our high priest. Um, now, sitting at the right hand of the Father is like going into the Father's presence. And as far as people who have criticized the investigative judgment are concerned, that was in the most holy place. And um, there is a key verb within the book of Hebrews um, that kind of explains this. Um, and it's Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And within this verse, we have within the veil um let me just pull up the greek i hope everyone can see this um just let me know when you want me to share it oh yes yeah, sure share it share it sorry okay sorry about that um I'm good yeah okay so i hope they can all see this i'm trying to like kind of walk through it and things like that so in hebrews 6 19 i've pulled up the greek but um, in Hebrews 6.19, we have um, a phrase, some people call it specific words, um, and that's esoteron to katapetismatos. And that's, to, that's, that's within the veil um, when translated into English. Um, that's to describe Christ removing um, within the veil, and this is, um, according to those who don't accept the investigator judgment, this is the second veil. And the reason why they actually say this is because the book of Hebrews is very dependent on the Septuagint. It's very dependent on the LXS and its translation. And So hang on, um, Leo, just let me explain that for people. So the Septuagint, yeah, also known as the LXX, um, which is, I believe, a Roman uh, numerals for uh, 70. And Septuagint also means the book of the 70. Hang on, let me just take this sharing away so you can do what you need to do. Um, so the LXX or Septuagint um, is a translation, which according to legend was translated by 70 Jewish, Greek speaking, or, you know, well, familiar, fluent in Greek scholars on at the behest of Alexander the Great or whoever it was for the Library of Alexandria. Um, probably not Alexander the Great, but, you know, when, when the Greeks were ruling Egypt. Um, and um, so that is basically the Greek Old Testament of the Bible. So the, the Old Testament of the Bible was written in Hebrew originally, which is the Jewish language, um, but it was translated in ancient times into Greek uh, by some Jewish scholars. So to some people, the Septuagint is a great wonderful resource because it's in Greek, which is more familiar to Christian scholars of the New Testament. Um, and it was an ancient translation. So presumably they knew something that maybe we don't know about the context in which it was written. But to others, it's a sort of an abomination because um, it's not the actual original Hebrew, you know, real McCoy. Um, so it just different people have a different attitude to the Septuagint, but it's often referred to either in a positive or negative light. And so what Leo is saying is that the book of Hebrews quotes frequently from the, it, it's, it's clearly quoting from the Greek version, which is slightly, you can tell it's a slightly different way of saying it than the Hebrew version. Okay. Do you want yeah. me to share your screen again, Leo? Um, that would be just wonderful. Um, yep. Okay, so um, I hope um, you all didn't lose track, but continuing on. So what we've established thus far is Christ has entered within the veil. Now, this phrase, within the veil, or translated into Greek, esoteron to katapetismatos, is used within Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16 is all about the Day of Atonement. And um, what the critics are saying is basically we've created a linguistic connection between Hebrews chapter 6 and Leviticus 16. And this describes the high priest's entrance into the most holy place. As we've discussed before, we have Hebrews 5, we have Hebrews 2, we have Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 7 describing Christ as our high priest. When did the high priest enter into the most holy place? We've not only created a linguistic connection, but we've created a contextual connection as well. 
It's Sorry, Leo, could you just clarify yeah. in, in the, the argument that you're describing, um, when you say we, who's making the connection? Because what I think you're saying is that in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews makes a connection with Leviticus 16 and with yeah. the, the Old Testament. Um, yeah. It's not us as Adventists making that connection. I, that's a connection yeah, that the writer makes. Yeah, I think that's a makes. much better way of putting it. Yeah, that's okay, a much yeah, better way Just clarifying, just clarifying that. that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so like, um, yeah, or um, this is what critics are saying, what the author is doing, that the sure. author is making these connections. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, the author is making, according to the critics, again, the author is making a contextual connection with Levit with um, the Day of Atonement, Christ being a high priest, when did the high priest enter within the veil, um, and a linguistic connection as well. And as we saw from Hebrews 1, 8, and 10, Christ and even Acts chapter 7, we see Christ at the right hand of God and we see in the book of Hebrews that he's sitting at the right hand of God. Like, that's God's presence. If he went within the veil um, and that's a connection with the Day of Atonement and he sat down in God's presence, it's like, okay, well, that's the most holy place. When did the high priest, want, like, the answer is like once a year he entered into the most holy place. Um so, yeah, I hope that that's a bit jumbled up, but I hope I kind sure. of, that there's a lot more in between. Like there's, what, what does Tagia mean? You know, does that describe just a sanctuary? Can that not describe the most holy place? Does it describe the sanctuary as a whole or specific apartments? That's another minor detail. Well, not really minor, but just another detail. <laughs> that we can perhaps get okay. into. Um, so, but, Leo, you're giving us a good, uh, good jumping off point. So, um, yeah, it's a good so let's place, focus in on that. Yeah, yeah, let's focus mm. in on that point that you just made. I'll switch off your screen. Cool, yeah. Yep. Um, so, let's focus in on the points that you were just describing. Um, so, it's, for example, in Acts 7, uh, 50. Uh, 50, uh, 50, whoa, whoa, 56. It's about 55. 56. It's 56. 56. 56 yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry, it's in 55 as well. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. And so I've, I've shared some of the references up in the, in the comments um, for anyone that's watching, might be having trouble keeping up. Um, so we haven't necessarily read through all of these, but I'll just read uh, for verse 55 and 56 of Acts chapter 7. And it's talking about Stephen just before he was martyred. It says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So the point being, Leo, that, that you're saying the argument is that the right hand of God, well, that must mean the most holy place. That's, that's yeah, the argument, right? Yeah. That's yeah. God's presence, and where was the Shekhi where was the Shekinah glory? Um, yeah. That was between the cherubim. So, mm. Yeah, which which is in above the Ark of the Covenant, in the most holy place in the sanctuary in ancient Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So, if I could advance that argument another step, that is, I think, not an unfair advance to make. Why would Jesus be anywhere that wasn't in the very presence of God at any time, right? So logically, right, this, what this is basically saying is there is no ministry that Jesus has in the holy place. His entire ministry is in the most holy place because Jesus will always be at the right hand of the Father from the time of his ascension um, into heaven. That's basically the, the point, right? Hmm. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I kind of, yeah, Adam, I mean, I, I want you to jump in because I've done a lot of black. <laughs> I understand. On, but... No, no you're that's right. good, Leo. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's interesting. I, I, suppose, I suppose a question comes in, a, a few things come to my head or thoughts come to my head with that. One, when we um, – I remember the first time I ever got asked that, somebody said, um, have you not read that Jesus sat at the right hand of God? And I, I – and I said, yes, I have. And she so goes, so how could he go to the holy place if he went straight and sat at the right hand of God? And I stopped for a second. I thought, hmm. And then I looked at him and I said, why are you assuming that the right hand of God is in the most holy place? And, and, and he couldn't answer that question. He'd probably never been asked that question before. That doesn't mean he wasn't right, but he couldn't answer it right then and there. Um, and, but, but, it gave me some food for thought too. It's interesting in Hebrews um, within the veil. Now, 
textually, if you use the LXX um, like we did, within the VAR, yeah, it does fit with um, Leviticus 16. I wouldn't say contextually you could make that claim. I think you could certainly make that claim textually. Maybe there's a slight allusion to the idea of being in the presence of God, but um, Hebrews 9 also uses an, an interesting point in Hebrews 9.3. It says, and after the second veil, mm -hmm. the tabernacle, which is called the holy, holiest of all, mm -hmm. or the holy of holies. This holy of holies, it's actually the only place where the holy of holies is actually used in all of Hebrews. This, this one verse mm -hmm. is the only place where it's mentioned, and it uses it, the second veil. So when I look at whoever the author of Hebrews is, I ask the question, if they said second veil here, they understand in the sanctuary there's two veils, right? There's, there's the veil into the holy place and there's a veil into the most holy place. Mm -hmm. And so being that he uses second veil here and the connection to the most holy place and then everywhere else he uses the concept of veil and doesn't use the most holy place, that tells me that the author of Hebrews is predominantly speaking about the holy place ministry of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's just the inference I get. So, all right, well, if, if we're just in the veil, within the veil, and we're in the holy place, is there any evidence for this um, idea or concept? Um, I would get into the um, dedication of the temple, which there's certainly evidence of that in Chapter Absolutely. 9 of the dedication of the temple, in which, which um, the priests dedicate and anointed both the most holy and the holy place, mm -hmm. right, at the dedication. Um but the other interesting point that I'd make with that, and, and I, I hope we've got our thinking hats on, is Revelation, I think, gives us a little insight into this, right? Because in Revelation, we know, um, for instance, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, and I'll try to keep this short, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, Hebrews tells us that where is Jesus? He's in the heavenly sanctuary, right? Hebrews chapter 8 makes that very clear, the sanctuary that was not built by man but by God in heaven. So then by the end of chapter um, 1, we find Jesus, or, or near the end of Jesus, we find Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Mm -hmm. So we're automatically sanctuary language, right? Here's mm -hmm. Jesus ministering. It's revealing Jesus, our high priest. He's in the candlesticks. Then we come to chapter 4, something interesting happens. Um. And I'll put it this way. So Jesus is in the sanctuary. In chapter 1, you find the candlesticks and the seven um, churches connect to that candlestick. When you go to Revelation chapter 8, you see Jesus um, at the or you see the golden censer, the golden altar. Yeah, of, yeah. Uh, right? And, and then what's connected to that? Seven trumpets. So you notice... Uh, and then when you go to 11 as well as um, 15, you find the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place, and connected to that is the seven bowls of wrath, right? Okay. So here's something interesting before I get to it, and there's a there's a method to my madness, so bear with me for a second. So you first got the seven golden candlesticks. Remember, this is a revelation of Jesus, who is our high priest, <laughs> Hebrew says, in heaven. So the seven candlesticks, and it's connected to the seven churches. Then we see Jesus at the altar, golden altar of incense in chapter 8, and it's connected to the seven trumpets. So the seven's always connected to something in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Then we see, we see the Ark of the Covenant's connected to the seven bowls. But wait a sec, there's another seven that we totally skipped over. It's the seven seals. Mm -hmm. What are they connected to? Well, what's left in the sanctuary that we haven't looked at? It's the table of showbread, right? But I want you to notice the table of showbread is never mentioned by that name in Revelation, but I believe it's here. If you come to Revelation chapter 4, I haven't looked at this for a while, so let me, oh, yeah, 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 I think I know where it is. Um, okay, so we've got the candlestick. Now, the, notice this. Um, we go to chapter 4. And we, um, I'll go, start from two, and it says, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one okay. sat on the throne. And he that sat on it, there's a description of him. And then it says, verse four, that there were, there were these um, living creatures around about 24 seats around about it. And then it talks about lightning and thunderings coming out. 
which and it talks about seven spirits of God. And then Revelation 4, verse 6, it says, and before the throne. So think sanctuary here, all right? Because this is where wait, the, wait, sorry, what verse is this? So on verse 6, Revelation 4, verse 6. Uh-huh. So you've really got to think sanctuary. If you don't think sanctuary, you'll never see what I'm about to say. So it says, and before the throne. Uh-huh. There was a sea of glass like under crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts with four eyes before the um, before and behind. And then I want to just skip down. Wait, let me find it. Did I skip it? That wasn't the verse I was after. Around the throne, I see, yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't prepare this because I didn't know we we're going to go here. No, that's fine. Um, I'm actually <laughs> writing all of what I'm going to respond to, like in the chat box below. But like, honestly, talk, this talk. Is, yeah, well, I look for this, it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so this is really interesting, and it's so bad. Like, I would. Can we actually have more than an hour? <laughs> we'll just do an hour for today, and oh, we'll yeah, do okay. another one next week, yeah, or the, all the week good. after, if we if we can't make it next week. But anyone watching, uh, expect us again next week. So that way we'll be accountable and we'll have to we'll have to do it. Can't put it off. So, look, I, I do get that it's a bit difficult. You know, it's hard to, to pull up verses, but I've already written in the chat about a 1,000 verses that you guys have oh. already just mentioned off the cuff. So, I mean, at least chapters. Um, so it's good. It's good to have stuff that we can go back and we can study. Oh, okay. And, um, yep, and... Because we haven't, like, this is not a formal, you know, premeditated presentation. We're not always going to have everything right at the tip of our tongue, but that's cool. We just would roll with it. So, Adam, I think you got it now. Yeah, I, I found it. It was the verse before the one I was looking at. Okay. It's, it's always five. like that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's verse it's always five. the last verse you look at. <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> right. <one> before. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. notice what it says here in Think Sanctuary, like I said. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning where? Before the throne. Before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, so think yeah. sanctuary now. The throne, what's in front of the throne? The seven the candlestick. Seven lamps or the seven burning fires of God. It's the candlestick. It's represented the candlestick or the spirit of God. Or um, the lampstand, depending on your translation. Sorry, just just letting everyone know. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's sometimes right. called a candlestick or a lampstand or whatever. That's that's what we're talking about. That's right. And so yeah. to give you an idea, and people can study this, I'm not going to break it all down, but if you read Revelation 4, you have the Father there, you have the angels there, you have the 24 elders, but Jesus is nowhere to be seen. Then you skip to chapter 5 and suddenly there you see Christ in the midst of the throne with the Ancient mm-hmm. of Days. Mm-hmm. So the point I'm trying to make is we always think he sat at the right hand of God. We don't realize there was a throne or a representation of the throne in the table of showbread, um, which is interesting. It's an interesting study. Um, I'd love to dig in more deep, but I'm certainly not ready at this point. Uh, sure, but it's a fascinating <laughs> thought, something to something yeah. to muse on. Yeah. But I think so, the point I'm trying to make ultimately is Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, there's evidence i believe that that was in the holy place and 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 when i say holy place the bible makes us understand it as two apartments whether there really are two apartments i'm not going to get into that debate all i know is we understand it it like that yeah yeah that's right it's an illustration it was not yeah it was not um it wasn't primarily a physical blueprint it was primarily a spiritual blueprint yeah Look, I mean, even if it was, it doesn't make a difference to me. Um, no. <laughs> I, to, I'm to happy me, to accept that it is, but it doesn't yeah. have to be. Uh, if you, if you don't right. think it is, then I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> we can get along just fine. But, but right. what we do need to do is understand that it's explained to us as if there were two apartments. Yeah. So even if there wasn't, we need to understand it as if there were, I think anyway. Something okay. else on, on that idea of having sort of thrones in multiple locations um, there's you see in, in chapter 4 of, of Revelation where it talks about that throne, there are four living creatures. Mm. Now, to most people, that just sounds bizarre. But to you guys, you're students of the Bible, what does that remind you of, those four living creatures? What book it's of the Bible? Book of it's not the book of Daniel. Oh, it's not really? the book of Daniel. 
ZQ. Yes. Oh, that a beast. For once, that? Daniel was not the right answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ezekiel had a Ezekiel. Yeah. Yeah. And now Ezekiel is very interesting because, of course, he was a contemporary of Daniel. Um, yeah. So there's a, there is a connection there in a sense. But um, he was also an exile. Uh, but when mm-hmm. he was taken into exile, I think it was a different exile, and he mm-hmm. was uh, he was older at the time, and he was actually of the priestly caste. And a lot of his um, a lot of his book is all about the sanctuary and that kind of stuff. So it's it's quite an interesting study in itself. But mm-hmm. the book of Ezekiel is famously hard to understand and, and difficult. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it opens with this particularly weird scene of God on a throne, carried by these four living creatures with the same kind of descriptors as it's found in Revelation, right? Mm. And God is tr- is traveling, as it were, like like a, a UFO. And this is where, you know, people get these weird conspiracy theories <laughs> about, you know, ancient documents containing references to UFOs. Sorry, if, if it's actually true, I'm sorry. I just assume it's conspiracy theory and it's not true because I know no evidence for it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so if, look, if you want to troll us about that, then go, go for it. I don't mind. <laughs> but the point is that, there's this description and it's weird and it's like, well, what on earth is this talking about? But there is one message in that that's really clear. And that is that God is not limited to Jerusalem. God is not limited to one place, even though Ezekiel is having to leave the place where the temple was, where he was meant to have a great career as a leader of God's people. And now he's out in whoop whoop, um, you know, with a bunch of slaves or whatever as a slave himself, you know, God is showing Ezekiel that he's he's still with them. He's able to move. He's able to be everywhere at once. So to me, finding this here in Revelation 4, just where you're talking about how this is the, the holy place ministry, mm. it's like it's not God is not bound to be in one place at a time. And it's it's almost like God is putting in that little hint just there where you might be tempted to think, Oh, God is only in the most is only in the holy place right now not in the most holy place or something. It's like that's you missed the point. God mm. can be everywhere at once, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that he's got to be in one location. It's that there's a phase in his ministry or there's a phase in the earth's history or whatever it is that we'll get to later. But, you know, there is a significant implication. Otherwise, why would God give us this in the first place? Why would he, yeah, yeah. he talk about this, right? There's mm. something significant mm. in it, but it isn't, as they say, the heavenly geography. Mm. May I say something um, along those lines? Um, right now, I mean, we've given a couple of scriptures and I've given a few points. For, for me, the, the revelation point is interesting and, and I think there's something there, but it's certainly maybe not the strongest argument in and of itself. Um, I think one of the big arguments is, like I said in 9.3 of, of Hebrews, that it's the only place, it mentions second violence, the only place that actually, I know a lot of translations say most holy elsewhere, in um, it, it indicating the most holy place, but it's actually only mentioned once in all of Hebrews specifically. And, and I love Hebrews 9 because the author is so clear as to which apartments he's talking about that you actually get a words that you can test and look where else do they appear, what is he really saying. And sometimes he's referring to the entire sanctuary. Most times, I think it's about eight times when he writes, he's actually referring to the holy place and only once in that place. And he uses the word second veil in conjunction with that, whereas elsewhere he just says within the veil. Um, So, I mean, no matter how you look at it, I suppose it would be hard to dogmatically say he was in the most holy place because it uses within the veil. Linguistically, I know it connects, connects to Leviticus because Leviticus was within the veil. It was just the second veil, which you know clearly from the biggest context. But in Hebrews, the context tells us it wasn't within the second veil. It was within the first because it's just called the veil. Um, and he uses second veil for most holy place. I think the other thing we need to distinguish too, and I thought we'll discuss this eventually, is we just need to ask ourselves, all right, in the second veil, there was a specific purpose other than the dedication day where both came into play, that's the only other time that the most holy place came into play. Otherwise, it was the Day of Atonement, which was once a year, signifying a once-off event. So we, we, if we can distinguish biblically, when does this once-off 
Certainly Hebrews talks about dedication day. I think that's very relevant in Hebrews chapter 9. I believe that's there very clearly. But And a lot of people falsely attribute that to the Day of Atonement, but I don't think you can maintain that position personally, and we can explore that later if we need to. I'd love but um, but uh, certainly consecration day, there's, there's allusions, even with the LHX, actually it's very helpful in this regard um, to allusions to the, the consecration of the temple. But I would ask the question, if we can establish biblically when does the Day of Atonement occur? Is there any way to establish? Because if we can, we would totally answer the question without any um, lack of clarity as to where was the right hand of God, um, you know, was this the most holy place or no, was this Day of Atonement or was it something else? You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, right. um, so, Leo, do you want to uh, make a comment and maybe say what you want to talk about next week? Um, yeah, um, there are a few things that I want to say. So in regards to Hebrews 9, Paul, the, the argument is that Paul defines his terms there. And um, I think that's really interesting because in Hebrews 9, 1, 2, I believe, when he's describing the holy place, he actually uses the word proton or protos or however the Greeks pronounced it. Um, and I think in kind of contrary to that, then he'd use a second or some, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, so I think there's like kind of a correspondence there, but I still don't see how this kind of is the deciding factor in whether the book of Hebrews is speaking about Christ entering into the holy, most holy place or not. Um, yeah, I, yeah think I, think, that, I think we'd agree that I don't think either of us would argue that the book of Hebrews is the main Kind of the main no, no, no. source. No, what I was saying was um, that those two verses. I think that yeah. looking at the greater context of Hebrews, there is definitely much more um, reference to the Day of Atonement, um, and the linguistics of Hebrews six nineteen, like those words together, esoteron to katapitismatos. That's the only time where it occurs, and. Um, and the only other time when it occurs is in Leviticus 16, which has the Day of Atonement all over the place. Not only that, but we also have Hebrews 13, 11, and Levit describing and even quoting from Leviticus 16, 27. So we have all of these, um, we have all these connections between Leviticus that can't be ignored. And it pains me when we look at Hebrews 6, 19, we see a direct connection with Leviticus 16, and it's all of a sudden speaking about something else. It's like the linguistics are so clear, as well as as well as the context. When did the high priest enter into God's presence once a year on the Day of Atonement. Um, and furthermore, I would also just like to point out Hebrews 7.27. Um, I think that's really clear. Some might even argue that that's when Christ actually finished his holy place ministry, which was on the cross, um, which would also actually further elaborate on the Day of Atonement context. One thing okay, that so I think... I think um... Uh, Leo, I think we've reached the uh, we've reached the conclusion about what we're going to be studying next week. No, please, please, it's um, a bit more we're out of time it's now. And we are going to give you the benefit of the uh, of having had the last word because we're not going to respond and uh, give our view on that. So we'll just all let right. that cook for a week, and next week we will <laughs> see you all again. So looking Adam, forward to that. <laughs> Ask, like, if you have free time, do you actually just want to keep on speaking about this? Um, Sorry? I, I, yeah, we, look, if you do want to talk about it, that's fine. Although it'd be better if everyone yeah. else could be part of it too. So um, let's uh, <laughs> let's call it um, a day. And um, maybe, maybe Adam, you could say a prayer for us to close. And, and then, no problem. And I yeah, think maybe next time we begin, and I'd like Leo to finish um, or maybe start again and, and finish that thought. Because well, yep. I'd, I'd like to hear the whole thought. Um, excellent, excellent. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. So, um, yeah, let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we're all realizing how short an hour can be. Uh, <laughs> it was barely enough to scratch the surface. And Lord, I just want to thank you for Daniel and Leo, their willingness to, to um, engage and and for us to ask questions. It's so good um, to be able to do this, and I'm really keen to hear. 
more of what Leo's got to say and, 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 and Daniel as well and uh, to grapple with these things and to wrestle with them but ultimately to come to conclusions hopefully that we can find clearly laid out in your word as well. So just thank you for that. Bless us. Bless those who have listened and uh, I can see this is going to be a long drawn out process so please keep us uh, on the mark in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. See you everyone. Thank you for those that were watching and uh, our two little mischievous boys will do what they want to do in the meantime. <laughs> so see you everyone. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there, there is my hand. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks for joining us. See you. <laughs>